Hey everyone, welcome in to another daily editorial here on the KE Report. Corey and Chad here, chatting with Dave Erfley, founder and editor of the Junior Minor Junkie. Now, look, Dave, we could talk about the overall precious metal sector on a day like today, Tuesday, February 13th, where the market is selling off. But in all fairness, it's red in pretty much every sector out there. I want to focus a bit more on some individual company news that has come out, both on the negative side and on the positive side, at least as you look at share price reaction here. Now, we can all take these news releases however we want. I really just want to cover some of the recent news that I've been getting emails about and get your thoughts on it. Now, I don't want to bash any of these companies because their share price might be selling off because a lot of company share prices are selling off in this sector and have been for a while. But there have been some news events here that have caught some attention in the market and caused bigger sell-offs. So we're going to start on some of the more, I guess, negative news in a sense where companies have had to come out to the market and mostly raise money. Let's start on the money raising front. We can talk about Serato Gold or Lion One Metals. Both apparently are having some issues funding builds. In Serato's case, Lion One, they are going through their build, but they came out to the market in the last week and announced a financing where the stock did sell off on the back of. Again, this is a bigger picture issue with the sector where companies need to keep on raising money and the cost of capital is much higher Dave, what was your takeaway from either of the news out of those companies and some of the reports for Serato Gold? Yeah, well, sure. We, we could start off with, with Serato. You know, I, I'm a former shareholder and um, I had a meeting with them at, at Beaver Creek and they told me that they were in the process of looking to raise $8 million. And you got to understand, they basically have two bank accounts. They have one to finance their Brazilian operations and then they have an uh their producing mine is in Argentina, which is capital controlled. So in Argentina, they have debt payments of, of about ten of ten million coming due in March, while they only have ten million cash. So they gotta they gotta raise more debt in Argentina or raise some cash, and they have to raise cash in Brazil because they're looking to finance their Mont Monto de Carmo initial capex on that mine. So they first of all, they've waited too long to raise money. The street kn kn knew that they needed to raise money. I don't even think they've announced a, a raise yet. And the stock has gone from 75 cents when I talked to them at, at Beaver Creek when they were interested in raising money and looking to raise money. And now it's down to, I think, 25 cents. So when they finally do come out to, to market, the dilution is going to be killer. The, the market is obviously punishing it for it. The street sniffs any raise that a company is is, is going to need. If you're not fully financed for your programs this year, the street is is sniffing that. They know you they know you need to raise and they're going to punish you and by the time you finally come to market the 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 dilution has been killer and also a lot of these companies have had to attach warrants of up to 3 years like Lion 1 just had to do. I'm a Lion 1 shareholder. You know my my myself and my subscribers have been accumulating the stock for the past couple of years because we saw the huge upside potential in it. The previous raise that that that, that Wally did, the CEO uh, Wally Barakoff did, was was ill timed, and they had to attach a full warrant. And those warrants are trading on the open market. Well, this finance was surprised the market. I didn't expect them to raise. The market didn't expect them to raise. They had twenty million dollars coming into this year. And they had four million dollars left on a on a on a credit facility. They announced an operations update on January nineteenth, saying they were gonna they were going to ramp up from three hundred tons per day on the mine that they just constructed to five hundred tons per day a year early. Okay, that costs money. They didn't say anything in the press release about needing more funds. Well, lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, after that update comes out, they announce a base shelf perspectives in the dead of night overnight. Right. And the, the, mar the market punishes it for it. And then by the time the terms are announced to the market the next day, the stock gets punished even more because it's it's basically 35 percent below market 
when they announced the the prospectus and it includes a three year warrant. And not only that, not only are they are, are are they hurting their current shareholders like myself and my subscribers, but management also has over two million warrants at seventy five cents that will expire next month out of the money. So this is how tight these capital markets are. This this is how concerned these veterans of these companies, you know, Wally Barakop has made me quite a bit of money in previous uh, ventures and companies that he's built and sold at huge premiums to the market. So these guys are very seasoned. They understand what's going on in the capital markets. And when they need to raise money, they're pulling the trigger when it's offered at, at whatever terms. Well, Dave, I think it's interesting to look at the state that the junior mining sector is in right now with relation to the capital markets, a higher cost of capital with higher interest rates, and some of the options that some companies are entertaining. Uh, in full disclosure, I'm a shareholder of Line 1 and Serato Gold as well. Not really happy to see you know, the dilutive financing come out of kind of blindside the markets with the three-year warrants, as you say, that'll probably get clipped four months out. But with Serato Gold, I just talked to Mike in Investor Relations just last week, and he said they were unable to raise capital the last couple of times. So they're working out a different deal to possibly bring in some kind of other transaction to bring in the money to pay that debt. And that brings up a broader discussion. Some companies are looking at selling non-core assets. Some companies are looking at bringing in strategic stakeholders to take a piece of the action. So they're diluting down the project level instead of at the equity level. Other companies are looking at royalties as a way to, to again, they're, they're diluting it down at the project and cash flow level from the mine in the future uh, to pay the bills today. I-80 Gold's another company we were talking about off mic, and, and they're entertaining bringing in a big partner that's going to help bring in some of the capital they need to keep the wheels turning. What's your take on all these different options companies are exploring to bring in money? Because it's not always the best idea to do an equity raise. No, and they understand that, especially at these share prices. So they're doing everything they can, especially the, the companies where the management holds a lot of shares, you know, and they're aligned with shareholders. The last thing that they want to do is dilute themselves. And I think that's what hurt Serato because management owns 15%. So they waited, I think they waited too long because they didn't want to, they, they thought they'd be able to raise money at higher prices. And when, when they're not able to, they're not only diluting their shareholders, but they're diluting themselves. So a, a lot of these companies, they understand that this is the, this is the tightest capital markets that I've, that I've seen in the 20 years that I've been in this sector. I mean, the the last few times that we've had these major sell-offs in 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 the gold in in the gold stocks, and the cycle appeared to be bottoming, and um, it looked like it was it was going to flip at any time. Capital was not that expensive, so now with you know with interest rates over five percent, capital is expensive and it's really tight. And the, these companies are a lot more choosy now, and on, on uh, these uh, banks are a lot more choosy now in who they're going to finance. So your project has to be airtight solid before they're going to even think about financing you. And a lot of these companies, they, they, you know, I mean, it's a race against the clock, right? I mean, how long can we stay funded before the, 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 the sector flips and the gold price gets over $2,100 and breaks out and stays above $2,000 and the market starts pricing that in. And a lot of these companies, they were smart and they raised money at the end of the year even though they, they, they upset their shareholders at the, at the time, but it, it, but in hindsight, it was a, it was a it was a great move because these companies are now fully financed for 2024. So if you're not fully financed for your operations and your exploration activities or whatever you're doing for 2024, if you're not fully funded, the street knows this, and they're going to keep pressure on your stock, and it's 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 not good for any company that is going to have to raise money within the next six months because the street knows it. Well, Dave, just following up on that, I guess what I was asking about was the other things besides equity, because again, with Serato, they're not going after an equity raise now. They're going after a different transaction. And with I-80, they're going after a strategic partner. So what about strategic partners? What about royalty companies? What about selling non-core projects? What about those kind of transactions instead of the dilute of equity raises? Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. I, I really didn't answer your question. So yes, I mean, that's that's a great strategy. You know, I mean, you basically the last thing you want to do is dilute your your shareholders at these prices. So they're looking at these constructive ways to raise money. You know, selling a a royalty, selling an NSR, or or spinning out a royalty, or selling off 
non-core assets. But but there's a problem with that because if you're selling, you're not trying to sell non-core assets right now. Everybody's trying to do that and you're not going to get anything near what it's worth. So it's best, it's always best to sell non-core assets when, when the market is doing better because you get more money for them. I own a couple of companies that have been have been trying to sell their non-core assets have been and have been unable to. The assets are sitting there and they're very valuable assets, but not in a market like this. So then they have to then they have to say, okay, wait a minute. So let's look at a maybe a, a strategic partner where we can partner up with a company 50-50 and they pay everything and we still got 50% of the project. You've seen that happen with with with, with a Cisco mining, in, in my view over drilled their project and spent way too much money drilling it. And then they end up giving up half the project, you know, for, for a lot less than the money they put into the, into the project. But, you know, this is what these companies are forced to do. And a lot of these, a lot of these developers right now, they got to raise three, four, five times their market cap for initial CapEx on their project. They can't do it. So, they have to find a strategic partner. They have to find creative ways to do these financings. You know, if it's if it's a if it's a high margin project, you know, that's two hundred to three hundred thousand ounces a year for over ten years. You know, that's a very attractive project, and especially if if, if they have you know some base metals on it or something they could stream, and the debt's not going to be a problem, then it's going to be limited equity they're going to have to raise. And in some cases, maybe even no equity if the if if the market gets a little better. So these companies are 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 in dire straits right now in trying to figure out how they're going to get their very attractive projects financed. Well, and Dave, you said it. These companies, some of them are getting forced into looking at these other options because they can't raise capital through equity, even through debt in some occasions. So. Look, it's what we've been hearing at conferences for almost a year now is these companies looking at other ways to finance, but it's it's not a seller's market out there. The, the people with money get to dictate the terms, which makes it tough on these companies. You mentioned there a, a company or, well, a, a strategy of spinning out a royalty. We saw that from Visa Silver recently. Now, in all fairness, Visa Silver is not a company that has trouble raising money. But it is broadly bucking the trend. We recently saw Visa Silver get added to the SILJ uh, ETF, and that caused a pop. Uh, the share price has given back pretty much all that pop. But hey, this is a silver stock in an uptrend with constant good drill results. So that royalty spin out. What was your thought on that news? I think it's I, I I think it's a smart move. You know, a recent example of this taking place uh, and being a positive development was with Great Bear Resources before they were taken out of Kinross Gold. They spun out a royalty subsidiary called Great Bear Royalties to manage those royalty interests on on the Dixie project. They, they spun off a two percent Neff Spelter return royalty, uh, along with a million bucks in securities and 500,000 uh, in cash. So that turned out to be a smart move, right? I mean, shareholders liked it. The stock continued to go up and Kinross came along and, and took out the company, despite the fact that they hadn't even proved up a resource yet. So I, I like it and I get shares in a, in, in a royalty, co- in a, in, in a spun out royalty company and also with, a, with a, a warrant as well. So I like the deal. Um, I know there's some analysts out there that said they didn't like the deal because it puts constraints on future construction. But let's face it, Vizsla is not going to construct this project. This is the, the, the one of the most desirable silver deposits out there right now. I mean, I, I believe like they do that there's over a billion ounces of silver equivalent there in that district. And, and, and they've already proved up what 300 million. So, um, this is a fantastic project. It's in a fantastic jurisdiction and. I don't see any problem with the royalty spin out. Okay. Since we're on silver, let's also talk about Defiant Silver. We've had them on the show before. I know other guests have brought them up. Earlier this month, they announced that they needed to restate some of their mineral resource estimates for a number of different reasons, and then also announced a financing on the back of that. How do you look at a news release like that where, look, they clearly have resources, but now they need to go back and restate them? Yeah, that's not good. And also, this is an earlier stage company that that already has a blown share structure. 
So this is the second piece of bad news uh, of defiance over the last couple of years. Uh, the first one was I used to be a shareholder, former shareholder of defiance. They had one of their properties. Someone came in and manipulated the system and took away the rights of their other project. And they're still trying. I think they're still trying to work that out. So um, at one point they were kind of in a catbird seat of exploration companies. They had 10 million. They had, they had about 10 million bucks, I think a little over a year ago. And, and the, the sector was, was, was not doing well. Good results weren't being rewarded. And they were only drilling with one drill. And people were upset that, hey, why aren't you spending this cash on drilling? Well, it turned out to be a smart thing because the, the $10 million lasted a lot longer. But now they've come down to where they're in dire straits again. And this is why you've got to be very careful in, in investing in these things. You've got to take a look at how much cash they're burning, how much cash they're going to need, what their plan is, how much cash they're they're uh, going to have to use this year and what's their burn rate and what are their expectations once they're done using that cash to drill. I mean, drill results really aren't being rewarded here. I mean, good results are sold off and bad results are sold off even more right now. So, you know, it's a very, very tough market. So you have to make sure that whatever stocks that you're investing in here, that you're, you know, holding your nose and whatever fishing line you're, you're buying right now, make sure that the reason why th the stock is selling off is, is because of a sector-wide sell-off, not because of anything the company is doing wrong. Well, Dave, I want to follow up on this idea of the resource being misstated because it can be a good thing or a bad thing for contrarian investors. And I would point back to Pretium originally misstated their resource, but obviously was a huge success story eventually being taken out for billions of dollars. Uh, that happened on a negative side when you looked at Rubicon and then it kind of cratered and, and people messed up, you know, the, the resource was messed up. But I'm thinking back to a, a stock that I know both of us have owned uh, and I still own, and that's Orzone, where they misstated the resource initially. It was a huge sell-off. I bought the crap out of it, and it was a big rise after that because they eventually fixed it. I just did the same thing with Gato Silver. They misstated the resource, cratered from $18 down to $2, uh, and they've gone back up to $7. It's been one of my biggest gainers by buying the misstated resource. When you know that there's ounces in the ground, they just... They get overly punished. Do you ever see it as a contrarian play where sometimes there's an overreaction, the market overdoes it, and then you can actually pick up shares on the cheap and write it back up? In a bull market, when capital markets aren't tight, yes. But look what happened with Defiance. They did it in a bear market where their, their, their stock was already depressed and they had to raise money at the same time. That's, that's like a triple whammy. But yes, I, I see your point. And um, in a bull market, or a bull trend in the market, it could be a good thing and you could make a good trade out of it. Dave, let's also talk about another company here, I-80 Gold. Now, one that is looked very favorably upon because of, in all fairness, their activities in Nevada. A few projects that they're moving forward, continued very impressive drill results. I know a lot of people are wondering where they're going to get this financing from. However, they have said that, look, they have a partner coming in the problem being even in the face of the good drill results, and it seems like everyone waiting for this news on the partner, the stock has continued to sell off. So how do you break down I-80 in terms of what seems like positive news flow, but share price continues to drift lower? There's so much to like about it, but the market continues to focus, continues not to focus on their three very high grade projects that they're de-risking at the same time so they could get their autoclave that's worth over a billion dollars which is you know like three times their market gap but they continue to focus on the 175 million dollars of debt and how they're going to finance these three operations well they've already like you said they've already announced that they how they were going to do this they're in the process of of getting a, a jb partner for their for their ruby hill project and they told me this back in at Beaver Creek. I, I was expecting it, and the market was expecting it when they announced it a couple of months ago. The company that's going to do the JV, they have 90 days to take a look at it before they announce it, and they have an option to, to extend it to 60 more days. So in the meantime, they raised $18 million recently. Well, it, it just goes to show the quality of their assets that they were able to raise this $18 million, no problem, and with no warrant. So if you can raise that kind of money in a market like this with no warrant, it really speaks volumes 
about the quality of your assets. So I'm not worried about I-80 Gold. That's one company. I'm definitely not worried about it because of, of what they have there as far as infrastructure and the grades they're coming up with in their project and, and the over, I think, 16, 17 million ounces of gold and 180 ounces of, ounces of silver they already have. But yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's a tough market when, you know, when you've got a, you know, an obvious big player like this that has fantastic projects, they continue to focus on the financial side instead, because that it's, it's just a really tough market. And until the market begins to price in a $2,000 floor in the gold price, and that's not priced in yet. Well, Dave, this brings up an interesting point about value creation from the company standpoint they're working hard to build value by drilling in the ground or by you know they're producing and shipping it to nevada gold mines they've had good results from ruby hill from hilltop from blackjack from the fad deposit and they've done all this work and they've continued to sell down lower and lower and lower because of like you just mentioned the market concerns about the financial side even though they've also announced that they have that partner coming in do you think we're in an environment right now where the value creation that's being ignored and shrugged off as the whole sector goes down the drain is eventually going to be the very optionality that propels it higher when people say, well, wait a minute, look at all this good news that they actually did. Look at all these resource estimates companies have put out and economic studies. Do you think all of this value creation eventually gets re-rated when the sentiment turns? Absolutely, I do. I mean, I've been trading you know, gold miners successfully since 2003. But valuations in relation to the gold price have never been more attractive for such a long period of time than they have over the last 12 months. I mean, when we had a, a bottom being created in 2016, when the, when the HUI to gold ratio was trading where it is now, the lowest I've ever seen it, the, you know, speculators started to, to get into these stocks, but there was one more move lower. And it, it and it flipped and, you know, it left a lot of people behind. That's the way this sector acts. But yes, I mean, there's extreme undervaluations here, especially in relation to the gold price. We, there's going to be a mean reversion, right? We know it's coming. Will that mean reversion be the gold price sinking and the, and the gold stocks not going as much, at, as low as the gold price? Or does that mean that the gold stocks are finally going to start to catch up to the price of gold? I mean, I, I believe it's the latter and that's the way I'm investing. And that's the way I'm, that I, that's the way I'm recommending my, my investors, uh, my, my uh, subscribers invest. I mean, these, uh, the, these quality optionality companies are the, as far as I'm concerned, are the, are the, are the best stocks to invest in right now. They've already found the gold. It's already there. They just need to to maneuver these capital markets as best they can to to reduce the amount of dilution for their shareholders to get their project built. That's the, the main goal right now. And that's the, the toughest thing to do right now because of the capital markets being so tight and money being so expensive and, and banks being so stingy and giving it out to these to these juniors. But yes, I mean, I, I believe that, you know, when when the switch flips, it's going to be the quality projects that flip flip first after the the majors and, and, and the royalty companies, because those are going to flip first. But when you got Newmont Mining, you know, the the largest gold stock in the world and the, and the most followed and, and most invested in tr- continuing to trade at 52 week lows and continuing to sink lower. I mean, then there's just there's just no interest in investing in juniors and you could tell that by by the volume the volume continues to dribble lower even though the the gdx and gdxj are now finally testing those october lows like i suggested they would a couple weeks ago it's just there's just no interest yeah well and again that ties into the lack of financing something we keep circling back to these companies they need to be able to raise money they need to have money in the bank to keep moving forward one final stock that I want to ask you about, Dolly, Varden, Silver. We've talked about them a number of times, focused in the Golden Triangle. They have solid drill results as well as they've been consolidating land in the Golden Triangle. Now, they're not at 52-week lows, but they're also not breaking out. So that they're a bit more a mixed bag here in terms of the share price performance, but they're generally higher than where they were a couple of years ago. What's your thoughts on some of the recent news out of Dolly Varden Silver? Again, good drill results, not exactly popping the stock higher, but it's hanging in there. 
know, I agree with you. This is a this is a fantastic company. You know, Sean Kunkun's come in and done a great job raising capital at the right time. And he's he's attracted the right partner and Hecla. They keep giving him money. All their money uh, in the Treasury right now, which I believe is close to ten million dollars, is hard dollars. So he can co- come into the market and, and raise some some cap some 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 flow through capital at at a at a large premium to market, which I would expect him to do probably when he needs more money. And um, I expect this company to be taken out by Hecla eventually. I mean, it only makes sense that they would have. A, a triangle in the in in the golden triangle of Greens Creek and uh, the the uh, package they got from Alex Alexco Alexco all the way down to to uh, Dolly Varden's project where they're now a, a a large partner. I think they've gave they've given them twenty million over the past year or so. So yeah, I mean that's what you have to look for when you're investing in these things, right? I mean you look at not only um, their share structure but who owns those shares. You know what kind of capital have they attracted, and then hope that once they do get bought out, they're bought out for a, a larger premium than a lot of these companies are being bought out for recently. Some of them are take unders that we've talked out, talked about before. So that's the thing, right? You're worried about the dilution not catching up with with your with your upside, because you know I invest in these things for for at least three times upside. I won't touch it unless I unless I see three times upside. And a couple of the stocks I own now where I saw that three times upside, a, you know, six months, a year ago, it's probably a little lower than three times upside now. You know, I'd be happy with a double in some of them even. So that's what you basically have to do is wait for this, you know, for the for the sector to, to, to turn before uh, your stocks go too much lower than your average cost. All right, Dave. Look, the fact of the matter is it's been a tough sector. It's been broadly a bear market for these stocks for the last two to three years. And even good news has sometimes been a selling event. But there are a number of companies out here doing good work, even with limited funds. And some of these build outs, too, they cost money. But the whole goal is to become cash flow positive. And the market, while they doubt it the whole way up, when they do become cash flow positive, it can be a good sign for shareholders and for the market. But overall, these are just a number of news releases that we have received emails on. So we just wanted to get Dave's insights on it. And Dave, I really appreciate you sharing a number of these companies, ones that you follow closely in your newsletter for your subscribers. So if you want to find out more about Dave's newsletter, Click the link below. Dave will chat again in another couple of weeks, hopefully about some more positive news. But right now, it's good just to take care of a lot of the recent news that's come out in the last few weeks. Thank you very much for your time, Dave. Sure thing, Corey. Talk to you next time.